I'm going to talk about how to do deployments of your website through the parent installer and how that can help you, basically. So who am I? Uh, I'm an Icelandic guy with a really, really weird name. Uh, I work for iBuildings in the UK, which is a partner of Sand, and we basically help Sand do things they're not smart enough to do. Um, I'm in the peer group, like, like Toby said. I'm a peer developer. I maintain peer.psp.net, and I basically do everything you can think of in peer. I spend basically too much time in peer. So, no social life, all peer. So, how to pronounce my last name? That's a question I get everywhere I go. Um, so, my last name is Thormar Thorbjörnsson. And as you can see, there's this weird character over here, the thorn. That's something a lot of people mistake for a P, D, V, or something worse. Uh, the ASCII version of my name is Thormar Thorbjörnsson with a TH, and the Ö being OE, which is pretty normal for Germans, I guess. Um, if you want to learn how to pronounce the name, pronounce that TH like that, or a thorn of a rose, thorn. So, now you're more enlightened about how to pronounce Icelandic characters. And hopefully you can say my name properly later on. So, the peer installer. Who knows what the peer installer is? All right. Too few of you. Basically, the peer installer works like yum, apt-get. It's a package manager. So you have a package, you want to install it, you do it through peer installer with the command line peer install name of the package. And it installs to your include path, and which makes a lot easier for you to include code everywhere instead of having to maintain it into your own application, having to have your own library folder. What we, I do with peer for the peer.psp.net is I deploy a website through a package manager. That's something not a lot of people do. They use different approaches. They use SVN, they use uh, FTP, they use RSync, name it, they use it. Capistrano, it's one big thing. But I'm trying to present an alternative. I'm not trying to replace any of your old systems, something you like, you use it. This is something I like, so hopefully by the end of this you like it too, you want to try it, it's great, but I'm not trying to sell you an idea, I'm just trying to present something that could help you in the future. So, like I mentioned, the alternatives, it's FTP upload, rsync, capistrano, deploy from your version control, and etc. A lot of people ask me, why do you use the peer installer to do it? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. It's made to deploy like PHP libraries, like small packages. So I live with a guy, a flatmate of mine. He's Ruby, all Ruby. The only thing I hear all day, Ruby, Ruby, Ruby. So Capistrano, why don't I use Capistrano? Simple reason, I'm a PHP guy. I don't want to learn another language to deploy my PHP website. So why would you? Um, using SVN deployments, fair and square, I mean, in my company we have a specialist that handles our deployments and they do it through SVN. And that's pretty good, but I wanted something more, something easier, some extra steps in the way that could help me. So what I get with the peer installer, I get easy upgrading. So basically, I release a new version of my website. I run a single command. It pulls in all the dependencies, installs it to the server, upgrades everything, upgrades the website, voila, ready. I have custom tasks. I get, um, on installation, I can do replacing. I might have a keyword like, at key at. I want to replace that with the um, hostname of the website on installation. I want to replace that with a path 
in a system like the application path, the root of the whole application. I could do that through that. Uh, post installation tasks. That's something a lot of people write as as H tags, shell scripts, whatever. Those basically are the tasks you can run after you install your website. For example, database upgrades, database installations, priming your caches. Just think it up, you can do it. It's just PHP. Custom file roles. That's something that's really powerful. By default, we give you source, PHP, data, tests, and www file roles. All of these install into different directories defined by the installer, which you can configure. So if you want to do something special, if you want to, for example, take your template files and do something with them on installation, maybe cache them, put them into your database, whatever, you do it through those. This is just a special role you write and in the package XML file that defines the whole package, you define it in there that this file is of this role and the installer will handle the rest. Also, you can depend on peer installable packages. Let's say that we have a website that does databases, it does graphs, and obviously you want to depend on something good, so you'd use Easy Components Graph or use Pair MDB2, and you can easily depend on those, and the system will figure out: Do you already have it? If not, can I get it? Do I need to upgrade? Do I need to install? What do I have to do? It handles all the bullshit, basically. So you don't have to keep downloading right before a release. Do I have the newest one? I have to go to ten different websites. That's really consuming. I've done that. I've tried to keep a big library of different components from different websites in sync with the application right before a release. It's so tedious. You're so worried that you have to like reverse the release because you forgot something. You messed up. You forgot like one important file that you're using everywhere. It might have got, gotten lost because you're copying on your local computer. It sucks. You did something wrong. And so, with the peer installer, it's a lot easier to split your website up. So basically what you do, you have a big website. You have a website with forums. You have articles. You have voting. You have a user system. Um, something fancy like mess ups, taking Yahoo Maps and Google this turning it together, that's one component of the site. So what you, would, you could do is split individual parts off into their own packages. And let's say you have this big release, like your first initial release. And then like two days later, you figure, oh, the forums are broken. And most of the times, what people have to do, they have to release the whole website again. Because that's how like deploying from SVN works. You have your whole website, and you just branch every release into a small contingency. And what you could do with Peer, you take the forum, you fix it up, and you only release the forum part. That updates, rest stays as it is, and you have a lot smaller part of the website to worry about. You don't have to think about, I'm fixing the forum, but when I do the release, Will this fuck up? Will this fuck up? Because with each release, even though you're just fixing the forum, the articles might break because the release process didn't go as smoothly as you wanted. And last but not least, but I mentioned this before, but we can, you can do the task, custom roles, and so on are all done and something most of you are familiar with already. You don't have to do Ruby, you don't have to do shell scripts. You just simply do PHP. Simple, easy. Why do you have to have, if you have a company and you have a deployment in Capistrano, it's a PHP company, and some guy comes in 
All right, we're going to do Capistrano. Fine. Then he leaves. Then you have to go and find another Ruby guy. We don't want that. You just want to take one of your other developers. Now you do this. This is PHP. It shouldn't take you long to learn it. So what's required to do this whole thing? Obviously, you need the appearance dollar. That's the core ingredient of the whole thing. Um, I'm not here to explain how peer packages work, unfortunately, because that might turn into a three-hour talk. But you have to know how packages work. You have to know how to package up your code. You have to know how the package XML works. That's really good to know if you want to do this, which obviously is a foundation. So you don't want to rush into it and having to learn everything at the same time. So I recommend, if you don't know it already, go learn how to package up small parts of your code. Let's say you have a database layer, database abstraction. Take that package up as a peer package and see how it works. Try to run with it for a couple of weeks. But if you're really smart, you can do it a couple of days. Even one day, no problem. You have to know how to read the fucking manual. This is really important. Even though we have really scarce documentation, you have to be able to go in there and read. Because there are really, really few people that actually know how to release the websites through the peer installer at the moment. So going there to the manual, I'll show it at the end in the resources. But going, reading the manual, being able to read source code, being able to dive into other people's source code, seeing how they do it, how they release their own websites through the peer installer is essential, really essential, because you want to see how other people do it, how, how they spent two, three, four weeks trying to master it, trying to do all those extra roles, do all those extra tasks, do everything that makes the installer really useful for them. And one good example of that is Midgard. And Henry over there has done some work or some of his team with the installer to deploy applications through Midgard. And it seems to work really, really well. So go have a look at how Midgard does it and how I think Serendipity does it too, uses the plugin system, used to anyway. They used to have the peer installer embedded into the Serendipity system and use it for the plugin system. I'm not sure how they do it now, but who knows. So dismantling your site. Obviously, you have to think about how you want to rip your site apart. You don't just take like every file has its own package or go crazy. You have to think about it. It has to be something you spend time on thinking like, I want to take the forums take them apart from it. I want to take the articles, take them from it. But maybe I don't want to take the user system from the core. Maybe the core is the user system and the database. So that would be the core of the application. So we would try to have that as the main package, as the main core that supplies for all those other minor packages you'll try to release. So yeah, micromanaging is really bad if you try to go too small in every package. You have to try to be a bit general in there. But trying to split them up into like, you have a website, split them up into five, ten packages. That's fine, not go too small. I, got an, I tried to do it. I ended up with a headache, migraine. Spent like a week drinking. Obviously on a vacation though, but the vacation was because of this. So. When you dismantle your website, each piece gets its own package.xml file. Because obviously each piece of the website turns into a peer package. So you have to define your structure in there. You have to define who is the maintainer, the change log. You don't have to, but it's really useful for other people to look at later what the fuck this guy was doing at release 0.5. So, and then the website itself has obviously a package XML too because it's two, a peer package. And the other pieces 
they have a required dependency on the core, the actual website. So you can't use those minor pieces individually. You couldn't install it and try to just use the forum without the database, the user system, and all the underground of the whole system. So the only thing that you can install independently is the core, even if it doesn't produce any output. So here's just a basic idea how you do it. You have a website. Just some simple teenage forum website, for example. And you have a backend. You want to move that one out. The backend does something fancy. You have the front end. This could be templates. This could be just your whole section that the people actually see. The forum section, you pull that into a specific package. Web services, maybe you have something fancy like a REST service, SOAP service. Then you have the core, the website. So this is basically the packages we would get and how I would name them. So now we have deployed our pretty little site, but we figured out we have to do some custom file roles. We have to do pre-install, post-installation tasks. So like I was talking about earlier, this is basically just your own file role where you can do those fancy things like put the template into the database, which I know a lot of people do, unfortunately. Um, these are the file roles we support by default. Source is something Packle uses. www is something new. It's for that part that you want the web, uh, that web users to see. So this is where you would put things like JavaScript, images, CSS, HTML. And we have a specific directory for that. So when you install to that, you can punch your WeHost to it quite easily. Then we have the data, the tests, and PHP. PHP, excuse me, is simply for your PHP files that you don't want to go into the web directory. And yeah, like I said, custom handling of data files is one thing you can do. Relations to the templates, the sky is the limit really. If you need something, if the default roles don't match what you have to do, write a new one, which you would anyway have to do if you have a shell script. You have to do some special handling. You could put it in there. This is on installation. So this is not something, this is not something you do with like database installation. This is not that. That's post-installation tasks. This is a really handy feature for everyone. And it's just a simple PHP task that you can use after the installation, you specifically have to run it. So you can use it to clean up after the installation. Let's say you produce some extra files in the installation steps, which is not uncommon. Um, you want to set up a database. You want to upgrade your database. You want to change some files in the database. You want to prime your caches. And a couple of other things could be well, priming web services as basically prime caches. So we don't run post installation scripts automatically. The reason for that, people can accidentally install some really bad packages, some like a hacker was trying to pull off as a really good package. And if we make those post installation scripts run automatically, he could do some really bad things through PHP with those post-installation scripts because unfortunately a lot of people are idiots. They install everything they find. They want to try things out. They don't think about looking at is this site legit? So we have to take steps to make people aware that this could be from an untrusted source. So you have to run this specifically. You basically have to write peer run scripts and name of the package you were installing. So this is basically how it would look after you have installed everything. So it notifies you that it has a peer web 
installation scripts over there. So you can run it by hand or through this command, but I really recommend running it through that command. It's a lot safer. So let's say I wanted to write a simple task, a really, really simple one. I know this looks scary and probably looks really bad when you watch it because I really hate myself to see code in presentations, but it's, it's horrible to see it in a presentation, seriously. But yeah, so it's just basic XML like the package XML files are. So you define, I have a post install script, it's role PHP, and then you wrap it with a usual XML, and you define tasks post install script. Then you have a parameter group. And over here, I've made a task called askdb. And in there, I have a simple parameter. It's the name is yes, no. This is the text you'll actually see. Install database. And the type is yes, no. So it's basically yes or no question which is pretty self-explaining, and I default to yes. So if you want to do installation through the database, you do this, you press enter, which means yes, and it go to the post install file, and you'd get the, which phase you're in, in the post install script phase, and you have the answer, so you can react accordingly and do whatever you want. So. In there, even if it says install database, you could do crash the system with deleting some important files. Even if it looks legit, you could do a lot of harm through that, which you can't do, obviously, if you don't just anything. Mm -hmm. Like running it with Perl. Well, I haven't thought about that actually, but um, no, unfortunately not. I think we'd probably have to write in the language feature into the package XML, or try to have it pull the actual prompts into a special language file. Yeah, that could work, actually. But we've never been really keen on trying to translate any of these tools because most of our developers or users understand English. But I get your point. I get your point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah, hmm. Yeah, that could be possible. I mean, uh -huh. no, yeah, I mean, just how to implement it. It's the question. Yeah. Well, that's certainly a feature somebody would want. And if somebody wants that, they should certainly put in a feature request and we'll think about it. Most definitely. <laughs> yeah, send a patch. The best approach to it. This is basically. Just the output of everything. Here I'm running this script from PeerWeb. And it has like a lot of output that it won't need really. It's just saying, I'm running this script. If you see any errors, it's in that file over there. Then it runs the install, post install script, runs the init function, and then you get the actual prompt. This is how it looks like. Uh, I've got to change that to install database because I copied it just straight for how I do it in PeerWeb. But this is basically how a yes no question looks like. It's just like a normal CLI interface question like yes or no, which most of you have probably seen a million times. Uh, are you talking about like unattended installations? Um, I haven't tried it, but 
where's Christian Weisk? Ah, he's not here. Apparently, Christian Weisk knows a way to do an unintended, unattended installation. So you could just throw it on the machine, run the script, go through everything, and just accept the default values. No. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I'm not sure. He was going to document it, the blog about it, but I think he came here instead of writing it up. So, yeah, that's certainly um, something that is possible. I mean, like Rasmus just said, it's something just yeah, expected. Yeah. Um, like I said, Christian knows it. <laughs> I don't. That's a part I haven't tried because I want to be on top of every installation I do because I really hate having something automated going on and then something fails and I'm, shit, now I have to go debug it. I like it when I just go in, do it, and I see the errors straight away and I can dive in. So, but yeah, that's something I'll make him blog about, definitely. If it's not like in there by default, I'll write it in. It's really useful. But we don't have a feature like Capistrano. Capistrano, you run from a single machine and you tell it to deploy everything to 50 machines. That's something we don't have. And they do it through SSH. If I remember correctly, I haven't really dived into it because it's Ruby and I don't care about Ruby. So. But that's something, another feature I was thinking about, but it's a bit dodgy. How does the parent controller actually put the files in the service? Does it do a copy and rename? Yeah. Does it? Yeah. So it should be. Yeah. As long as the files show up atomically in the web loop. It does. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's something I forgot. I'm too used to it. <laughs> but yeah, basically, the first time we wrote this whole web role, we deployed it on the peer machine, which also hosts Paco, which has APC. So we had to make sure that at that point actually worked. So, and apparently it did really well. So. Hmm? Yeah. That's one thing we don't do with the peer installer. We don't deploy, like we're upgrading this website HTML. That's something you have to do yourself because that's kind of beyond the scope of the installer, in my opinion, because it's a temporary file while we're doing the installation. But I know Capistrano does something crazy in regards to that. I think they do sim linking and the install then I change the sim link. Yeah, we're hoping to install a load balancer. Yeah. The real data is like HTML files that we put on the server that the load balancer keeps checking. Like, use the key static HTML scheme. Um, and then it will not do the test for that server. Yeah. Then you basically pull a server out of the rotation, deploy stuff to it. We'll use the reset of that server for us. We need to shut down the web server, deploy the reset, grab the web server back on. Then we have the server back in rotation. So the Yes, that's one of the things the peer installer could do because you're do, using the load balancer to keep everything in check and you're just taking yeah. machines off one at a time or whatever. So that's one way to get past the problem of users seeing some strange like missing files or whatever. There can still be issues because yeah. two machines are, have different versions of the software and the load balancer. Ah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's a ballet. Yeah. It's like doing tango, not simple. <laughs> so, yeah. Earlier on, you saw the XML for tasks, how you define it in the XML file and which file to run, which questions to ask. And if you want to ask more questions at once, you have maybe, you want to ask, what's the database host name? What's the database name, password, username? What's your grandma's name, whatever? You just take the tasks param group, which enclose the whole type prompt, um, the default. You just replicate that in, inside the param group. So if you want more questions, you just copy paste, copy paste, change. It's pretty easy. And on the next slide, I have an example of that. So there's the ability inside the actual post installation script so you can skip certain steps. So let's say if I do the, do you want to upgrade your database? And you say no. And obviously then you want to skip certain steps. You want to skip certain steps like you don't want to ask the database information. So you could skip that group based on the answer of the group you have before. But that's something you have to, I have a couple of links to files, how we do it in PeerWeb. And we do all of those things I've been showing you. So you can dig into the XML file, you can dig into the actual source and how we do actual releases in PeerWeb. So that should help most people that are willing to learn how to do this or explore this functionality. Um, so before you saw I had a yes, no type on the task. But we also have a password type and a string type. I think the peer installer, the current version control uh, of the peer installer doesn't handle the passwords too well because I saw them in, in the clear, no matter what I wrote. So it's kind of like using the string anyway. But the theory is the password should be hidden like with any proper Unix system. And obviously the string is just a string, like I have a question, what's your name? And I write Helgi. That's just a string. So you can expect a string coming from that. Here's an example of how we do it if you want to update your database. You say yes. Then you get, get those five questions. You can accept the default values by pressing enter. You can edit it by writing one enter and then it allows you to edit the driver. If you write all, it allows you to overwrite each step at a time. So you don't have to let go one, enter, edit, two, enter, edit. So it just takes you through each step. So sometimes I just want to edit the password. So I do three, enter, change that, no problem. But sometimes I want to edit the whole thing, so I do all. Is that my phone? Hmm, something funky going on. So this is how it will look if you have a big group of questions in one phase. This is, each phase would be, one phase is update the group, and update the database. Then all these questions are one group. And then you would have maybe another group, do you want to prime your caches? So you work with those in groups or phases or something else. Depends on your work, what you want to call them. So here are real world examples and I'm not going to go to those sites but for you guys that want to learn it, it might be really good and I'll publish my slides later on. But this is for the peer web, like peer.php.net. So the top URL is the main core of the website. So that includes the user management, how we handle our peer packages, um, the new system, and a couple of other things. 
But then we have a voting system for when we want to accept new packages into Peer. And I was having a lot of problems with that one. And obviously Toby left and he voted. So, um, but yeah, so I split it off into its own entity so I could just release that part of the website when I found bugs. I don't have to release the whole fucking thing. It's huge. And it has issues sometimes when I release it. So having this single thing to release this small part of the website is really, really important for me. And this is just a geek site. So imagine doing this in a real world important website. So you can just release this small part of the website that might be a lot buggier than the rest of the website. That can help a lot because it means you have a lot smaller release going on. So it means less time to verify things, less things to test. So obviously you want to test the whole thing, but you can focus on this small part. And this file here would be our post installation script. So if you look at all these three files, then you see how we do it for peer.php.net. And you should be able to kind of decipher how we do it, even though we have a couple of manual entries on it. And we have a book that Greg wrote. But it's a book. It's not a manual. You have to pay for it, which sucks. But that's life. So this is a really good place to study on how you want to do it. And if you have any questions, email me. And I'll try to answer you as well as I can. So earlier on, we had this whole pretty image where I tried to split up the forum, the web service, the back end, the front end. So we have these packages. And I have this website. I want to only install the core, the web services, the front end, and the back end. I don't care about the forums. This is a new site. So I could, in theory, reuse this. So I just install only the sub packages, and they'll pull in the website itself automatically. So this means you have to have a channel server for all this, but that's really the best approach that you have an internal channel server for your company to do this. And that's another thing I'm not going to discuss today. The channel server is basically where you store everything you released. You have a single server, a couple of mirrors, and you release package A to there. Then I can go to every single of these computers in here, every laptop in here, and do peer install package A. And voila, it's ready. So the basic idea here is I just install these parts of the website. So it doesn't just help you split up your website for maintenance, but it could also help you to have parts of a website and allow you to deploy it in different servers as different websites. So maybe you only have to change, let's say, the front end. You have CMS. and there's this guy I know that did a really cool thing. He had a CMS for a company. And with the channel server, you can log into the channel server with a username and a password. So every customer had a username and a password they had to type in when they did installations, when they did upgrades. So they have the core package of the CMS. And then the CMS has plugins. And Let's say I have company A and company B. Company A has access to everything. The company B pays $10 a month. So they have access to package 1, 2, and 3, but not 4 and 5. So when they type in their login and username, login and password, sorry, and they do peer install package 5, they'll get back an error. No, you can't install this. You don't have the proper rights. But they can install 2, 3 and one. So that's something you can also do. You can take your application. The same approach applies for your application and your website because they're basically the same thing. So you can do a lot of neat things with these approaches if you really want to dive in, if you really want to learn something and 
that takes time, unfortunately, to learn because we don't have good enough documentation. So if anyone wants to write one, go ahead. That would be awesome. But you can do really cool stuff if you find the right information to do it and have the proper goals in front of you. So some text I don't care about. So basically, what the command before did was take the web service front end and back end, join it with the website, and voila, it's ready. One thing you should take notice of, if you want to configure this whole thing correctly, do read up on the peer installer and do read up on the how the directories work. We have this special directory for the web pods and at times people can configure it incorrectly and that can be devastating like seriously we did it accidentally for the peer website the other day and we released a small part of the website but because when you do a release it cleans out the old file and replaces it with a new file. But somehow we managed to do some configuration improperly and we cleaned out the old file. It disappeared from the live server. But the new file installed in a directory that wasn't exposed to the web. So a part of the website died, basically. So learning the configurations, the different directories, it's really important because you could fuck up big time because you don't want your customer to see like, wow, a big chunk of your website disappeared or even their website. You have an e-commerce product and the checkout disappeared. They're losing thousands of dollars by the hour. So you probably want to dive into the peer installer first before you do the website part because you anyway have to learn how to deal with how to package up simple packages, how to package up simple parts of your library. And one thing to note, because we have a different directory for the VVV role, well, WWW role, and the normal libraries, you could take your website and dismantle it in a way that you have couple of things that install into the web directory. Then you can have things like the database layer. Excuse me. That's something you can easily make into its own package because everybody writes database layers. And you want to install it into the already existing include path. So you just put it into this nice little package, define the file roles as PHP, and it goes into the PHP directory. So you don't have everything in your public HTML root, which is obviously bad. And you want to be able to use things again, which would be devastating to have a website called a uh, website. So when you install this package website in the web directory, it actually creates a new directory called websites and puts everything in there. So if you have website number two and you install that and you planned on using web services between those two but you don't want it to access the same database, it would be a lot better to have that one somewhere in the PHP there available to everyone on the system. So you have to make sure you're doing putting the proper file roles on so it's it's a bit of a dance going on there. So you have to be sure what you're doing, but experimenting is good with this because I for sure have found the proper way to do it. I know a certain way to do it, but I'm sure somebody out there can probably do it a lot better, and hopefully they will because my way sucks, but it's still good enough for me. So this was basically just a summary of what you can do because if I wanted to talk about the whole process and go really in depth, 
I'll probably end up doing a workshop, which apparently we can't do over here now. So if you have any specific questions, I'd be glad to answer them now, sometime later today. Or you can email me at helgi at php.net. So if you have any questions now, so yeah. You can put messages back to the user. Mm. I haven't tried that. Ah, uh, you mean like you want to just be able to step back in the process? That's not something we can do at the moment, but that's certainly something that could be implemented. So if you want to put in the feature request or email me with the idea, then I can probably whip it up in a couple of weeks when I'm, my workload is a bit less. Are you talking about database wise or file wise? Um, I'm not sure if I get what you're talking about, but. Uh, um, we're, we, we actually, we take the file and we override it. Well, no, we basically rename it, delete the old file, and put it in. We haven't, I have been thinking about, like, Delta RPMs, if you know what, how they work. So you only actually install things that need to be installed, because, it really sucks having to download 500 kilobytes when you're doing a single line fix. So at the moment, yes, we do wipe the whole thing and install everything again. Uh, when you have a large post uh, installed script, it always uh, has to be run to avoid. Or can you uh, say that uh, the install script uh, Um, there is a, actually, when I think about it, there is a way. We ha you have the XML file, yeah. but if in your post installation script, if you have some information you want to replace it with in the actual question phase, you can do it. And you can probably do a lot of automation through the post installation script to know if you actually installed this before or you updated it. So. Actually, yeah, in theory, you could do that. It should be able to handle it. There are a lot of things you can do which I haven't explored because the peer installer is huge, too huge. It's bloated. It's fucked up. But it does a lot of useful things, even if it's fucked up. I mean, we can do a lot of cool things. Hmm? Um, we haven't done much lately. <laughs> Basically, um, the main guy that writes it, Greg, he's been on a tour. And I moved to the UK a month ago. 
So we haven't had any development on the new peer installer. Uh, like changes to it? Yes. Can I rely on Azure to work with your group? Yes. That's the idea. As long as you use the new package XML format, if you use version 1, we're dropping that. But obviously, everybody uses version 2 anyway, so except for like packages since six years ago. So everything will work. If anything, we're trying to add features try to make things easier to handle and we're going to do new cool things how you actually package up your code so it should be easier actually so that's something to look out for if we ever do it <laughs> if we have time um, you had a question earlier on about languages um, I just remembered now that you in the post installation script you can actually, or you should be able to do replacement. So even if the XML file defines hello world, you could overwrite it via the post installation script and write world hello. So if you do use the installation script to actually figure out the language and do the replacement beforehand through that, through the UE object, that's doable, yeah. But it's something most people don't do or know how to do. It's one of those black magic things with, that we have to really document and Because to me, it's more interesting. Like I said at the beginning, I'm presenting alternatives. I'm, I'm not trying to. So I'd say that it's a lot easier to pull in dependencies because you can't have SVN externals on everything. But you could do if you write everything yourself and you use only things that like proper developers write and they have everything in SVN or whatever and have it accessible so you can actually use SVN externals. So, but this way you could use through like easy components, uh, some parts of the Sun framework. You can pull in the dependencies you want to use through that. You can use the actual dependency handle. You don't have to think about oh, what happens if that guy changes the trunk of his SVN or you don't have to think about ah that guy released something new now I have to update my SVN externals peer installer handles that for you if they have pair packages but Um, if if they have it, no. You the only the post installation scripts. Actually, it will probably present you with the option. You have these three scripts you can run. Do you want to run run them? Out? Well, you have to run them manually anyway, as a security precaution. Because maybe I don't want to run something send made. Maybe they're trying to kill my peer packages because they hate peer. Who knows? But at the moment, uh, deploying through SVN or the peer installer, I don't see much difference or benefits to change to the peer installer. It's just a different way for me to do things. And it actually allows me to, let's say I use SVN like you're doing, and I have the whole like, this is version one of my website, I have a branch for that or tag version 2, 3, 4, 5, but then I take it, I check it out, and I package it up. So now I have two backups of the website. You can look at it from that point. 
and now I have a tar file, excuse me, with a website. So I don't need access to the company SVN server if I want to do the deployment again somewhere else. I have this file ready. It has done all the packaging. It has done all the replacements I need. So I think it just depends on the situation you're in if you really need it because like for the payer website, we were using CVS and we were doing an hourly rsync to update the website and sometimes somebody committed something I did a couple of times and it, it ended up in a fatal error maybe yeah exactly <laughs> but then I went away for some time and Never yeah exactly <laughs> and yeah Exactly, uh, but <laughs> then we decided to change it because we didn't have SVN and we didn't want to move the website from the main PHP.NET infrastructure because we want to keep with that because we like it to some extent anyway. <laughs> but then we decided to do it differently. We wanted to do the releases when we were ready to do the release of the website. So we decided to try this out as an experiment. And it has been working now for about two years, I think, one and a half or two. So what we do, we tag the release when we think it's ready. So we have the release in the version control, no problem. So we could actually deploy it from there if you want to, like you're doing with SVN. But then we take it, we package it up, we upload it to a channel server, and then we make a pair upgrade. We actually do that automatically. So now we have this double approach, but to us it's double security because obviously I was breaking too much to <laughs> for it to handle it. So that's why I like this approach. I've been using it for a CMS too. Like I was talking about earlier, a friend of mine did this whole thing where people had to log in, the customers. I did a similar thing, but I did it open source. I'm not sure if it's still around. Jav, Javsproject.org, I think, or something, where we actually installed components through an embedded installer. So people could, like, I want a blog, so they just Say, click on a button, I want block, we contact the channel server, it fetches the packet, does all the magic, boom. And that's, well, that's kind of the benefit for me, that if, if SVN deploy works, you should not look into this, unless you're curious, like seriously curious. So, any other questions? Apparently not, so thanks for your time. <laughs>